Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Uh, I uh, caught a little bit of an interview that uh, one of my uh, my partners on uh, Saga 960 did with uh, Kelly Lavalley uh, on uh, on financial implications of divorce. And so I thought it would be really interesting to have her on my show to hear a little bit more about what she's got to say. She's written a book on this uh, topic called Untying the Knot, um, and she's an expert uh, on this topic. Uh, so, uh, Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Kelly is a CPA, a CA, and a divorce specialist with an advisory practice helping people navigate financially complex divorce. She left partnership in public accounting after two decades to apply her knowledge of corporate and personal finance to support clients through her business of divorce. In her book, Untying the Knot, Kelly shows you how to manage your thoughts and feelings so you can untangle your finances with a clear head and calm heart. We discuss her personal experience with divorce today and the important first steps to consider if you're considering a divorce and some things that might catch you by surprise as you move uh, through that divorce. Uh, so Kelly, uh, let me ask you a, a question. Um, why did you write this book? I would like to reduce people's suffering while they're navigating the business of divorce. Of course, divorce is way more than business. But And some suffering cannot be avoided, unfortunately, when you're getting divorced. But I think that when you don't have support and you feel overwhelmed just by the practical steps that you need to take, it compounds an already pretty traumatic process. So I wanted to hopefully help people with that part of it. You said that you um, left corporate practice to launch your divorce advisory practice somewhat because of your own personal experience. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, I mean, I I went through divorce. My my parents divorced early, and so I lived, I think, <laughs> through childhood with my mom's challenges around it financially. But really, um, it was in my corporate practice where I would see, like most accountants, I would see clients going through divorce. And what happens um, typically, like when you work with business owners, the advisory team keeps working with the active shareholder and the company. And so you have this um, sort of, I call them the financially disenfranchised party who, who is, has lost their advisory team, who um, isn't probably as knowledgeable about the finances, doesn't have control of the asset base. Um, and so I, I, you know, was observing this need for support through that, through my corporate practice. And you, you said you also witnessed some clients going through a, a negative part of the process. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I started to work now, I work exclusively in divorce. I did some corporate work and divorce work for a while, but um, I just saw some, some very common themes um, I work with what I call the financially disenfranchised party. Um, so far, that's been entirely women. Um, and it's, it's a really scary time for them um, because they've lost their, their key financial advisor, their partner, um, and now they're a counterparty to that person. So, um, you know, that I, I really wanted to expand my reach in terms of providing support, not just to my clients, but, but to the world, Brian. And what do you do that a lawyer, a divorce lawyer wouldn't do? Yeah. So this is a, a legal process, but a, a significant chunk of that process is financial. So you should definitely expect that your lawyer understands the finances, but they're an expert in family law. They're not an expert in the finances. So um, for me, specializing entirely in divorce, I know a little bit about family law uh, just from my practice experience, but I'm an expert in the finances. So the lawyers that I work with, I mean, every client of mine has a lawyer. I encourage everyone to get a lawyer. It's a legal process, um, but you really do need, I believe, I have a conflict of interest, but you need financial advice and legal advice when you're going through just the, the business part or the financial part of divorce. And you're always working for the female? No, I mean, in my corporate practice, I worked with the, you know, owners of successful private companies and they happen to all be men. I didn't set out to just work with men, but that's what my practice resulted in. And now I work with the financially disenfranchised party in divorce. And, and so far that's been women. 
um, I think my particular value add, um, and I think what you should be looking for if you're navigating divorce, especially if you're not super comfortable with the numbers, is someone who can help you build that confidence. And so you need sort of a translator from this technical financial world to the real world. Um, and that's what you do. And that's what I do. Yeah. Um, the book is called? Untying the Knot. And where can one get it? Uh, any online retailer. You can go to my website if you like, lavalley.ca. And if one wants to access uh, your uh, consulting uh, uh, financial expertise, um, go to your website. Is that the best place? Yeah, yep, absolutely. And again, what is it? lavalley.ca. Excellent. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more uh, with uh, Kelly Lavalley in just a minute. And we're going to ask her, um, you know, what are some of the things to think about when considering a divorce? Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga Night 60. We're chatting tonight with Kelly Lavalley, who is a CPA and a divorce specialist. She's recently released a book uh, called Untying the Knot to help guide people through the financial implications of divorce. We're going to be talking a little bit about the process from start to finish. Uh, so uh, if you're contemplating divorce um, or you're in a divorce, uh, tonight's your night to listen in. Um, or even if you're in the middle of it or at the end of it, uh, I think there's uh, going to be something helpful for you. So. Um, Kelly, tell me, what are some of the first things to think about if uh, people are considering a divorce from a financial standpoint? Yeah, I think um, even if you're unsure, I think that it's valuable to go and talk with a lawyer. Um, and this doesn't mean that you're initiating anything. You're just becoming more informed about what this might look like. And of course, this is very much a personal decision whether you're going to get divorced, but um, there are many pragmatic implications that might inform your decision. Um, and so to understand your particular situation and what it might look like from a legal perspective is valuable. Um, I also think that it's worth, if you don't already have an understanding of your family finances, to gather that information. Again, this is just arming yourself with as much information as possible to understand what life might look like and what the process might look like. And I will say, um, from my own personal experience and from working with people full-time who are going through this process, that uh, I would work really hard to avoid divorce. It, it's not that I believe that it's wrong, but I know that it's incredibly hard. And I have gotten to the brink of divorce. And from my first marriage, I got divorced. And in my second marriage, my husband and I actually separated for a year and then we reconciled. So I know how it feels to be at the point where you're prepared to say it's over. And it is very difficult to imagine stepping back successfully from the brink. Um, and it is challenging and super challenging to do that because you, you might be at this point where you imagine, how do I even like this person again, let alone love them. But um, I, I think that working as hard as you possibly can to make the marriage work, even if you end up moving ahead with divorce, you'll know that you did everything that you could. And that will give you comfort when you're in some of the dark divorce days. It's interesting that you separated for a year and yet you were able to reconcile. Tell me a little bit about that, if you could. Sure. I mean, um, I'm not a marriage counselor, but <laughs> I think that um, separating is an underrated tool to work on your marriage. You know, my husband and I had been married for, for 12 years. We were separated for the entire 13th year of our marriage. It lived up to the, to the name, 13 years. Um, and after that length of time, we had ingrained some ways of being with one another that are hard habits to break, even if they're not working for both of you. And being apart from one another, I mean, it gave us a real taste of what it's like to be apart. Um, and we share two kids. So that's a big challenge as parents when you're sharing kids. Everyone who's done that knows. Um, and it help us, helped us break out of some of those negative patterns. So I would say, you know, when, when we hit our rough patch, when, which included 
counseling and separation. I would, you know, read books about it can be better after a rough patch. And I just thought, oh, please, you haven't seen this rough patch, but, but it's true. I found it to be true. <laughs> and so you're good now? We're good. Knock on wood. Well, that's great. And how many years have you been back together? Uh, we just passed 17 years. So three, four years back together. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you um, you've got in your notes to me, brutal honesty as one of the things you have to do. Tell me about brutal honesty. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that we hesitate to do is, is hurt our partner's feelings. Um, and I, I think that if you're on the brink of getting divorced and there are things that you, that are not working in the relationship, but you're hesitating to say it because you don't want to hurt your partner's feelings. I promise that divorce will hurt more. And so I think it's actually an opportunity when you're that close to it being over to get really honest with one another about what is and isn't working. Okay. Um, you also said that you need to talk to a lawyer when you're thinking about, even just thinking about a divorce. I think so. It's the, you know, prag, it's pragmatism. I mean, um, it could be a good motivator to, for working things out. I think there's lots of misconceptions. Um, you know, I think getting divorced or getting close to divorce is sort of like having a baby. Everybody has a baby. Everybody's, everybody's going to tell you about how it goes, but every divorce is unique and you really need to talk to a lawyer who specializes in family law to understand what yours is going to look like. Okay. Um, and, and what if you actually decide, yeah, it's time to divorce. What, what next? I think if you haven't been divorced, you kind of think about it as a line, like I'm married and now I'm divorced, but um, it's actually sadly more like a life stage divorcing and it can take a very long time. So it's natural when you're heading into it that you want it to be over as quickly as possible. And you think about the finish line because it's not an enjoyable experience, but I, I strongly recommend that you focus on what is this divorcing life stage going to look like and make sure that you are as safe and secure physically, financially as possible. Um, and and to try to, to manage all of the fear that comes with changing. I mean, it really does change almost every aspect of your life, but financially in particular, divorce is, you know, at best a big ball of financial uncertainty, but at worst and most likely it's going to involve financial setback. And that is scary. I mean, when you are living your life, you don't look at your house and think, look at this beautiful half of a house that I own. And so um, cutting, <laughs> it's only half years, cutting your asset base in half, which is, you know, often what happens, um, feels like a massive setback. And so it's scary. And I think that when you're heading into it, instead of stepping back and looking at the entire experience, think about the next steps and understand that until it's all resolved, you're going to very likely be scared and you have to work to compartmentalize that while you're making decisions so that you have a little bit more of a clear head when you're making decisions. So, so figure out how to manage the fear of that. And then just practically speaking, um, you know, you, you are in the middle of recalibrating your relationship with your ex and it doesn't happen immediately. So I think that, you know, when we think about beefing up our boundaries and not being as impacted by this person that we were married to, who we have been very impacted by, the, the first steps are practical. Like, get your own physical space. Begin the process of, you know, gaining financial independence. If you are, were the person in the marriage, because we have to divide and conquer when it comes to managing finances in our marriage. So if you were the person who controlled the finances, you have to begin the shift into releasing some of that control to your soon to be ex. And if you are the person who 
relied on your partner to manage the finances, you have to move into taking some of that control back. And so I, I encourage people to think about have a financial plan for that divorcing phase. Okay. Uh, you, you talk about recalibration of boundaries, many boundaries. What, what do you mean? You, you've mentioned financial ones. What other ones? Well, I think, I mean, ultimately where you're hopefully shifting to is your feelings. You're not as impacted emotionally or your, your thoughts aren't as impacted by the behavior of your ex. Uh, that's, I, I think, ultimately where we're heading as we move through uh, this divorcing stage. But I would say, um, especially initially, often people are cohabitating. It's, it is challenging on many levels, levels to establish two households. Talk about financial setbacks, not only slicing up the plot, the pie, but paying for two households. But, um, you know, I, I encourage people to accept that this divorcing phase is going to involve some stepping back financially, some what's going to feel like loss. This is the rainy day. And it is more important that you are in a position where you can navigate the process without feeling completely destabilized. And in my opinion, that includes having a separate household, if at all possible. But some lawyers will tell you, don't leave the matrimonial home. Okay, so here, here's my, my kind of general comment about, about the law and, and even finances when it comes to divorce. And that is, you know, the saying, don't let the tail wag the doll, like dog, don't let divorce wag your life. And so I, I think it's absolutely important to talk to your lawyer and talk to your accountant about the implications of decisions that you're making. And so if you can, if it makes more sense legally to encourage your partner to leave the family home, especially if you're a caregiver, say to the kids, great. And only you as the person going through the divorce can factor in the intangible um, criteria of your mental and emotional health and your ability to move through the process with your sanity. Um, and you, you, you need to collaborate with your lawyer about the impact that it might have on you to say, for example, continue to cohabitate with your ex. Um, talk about finances sort of as you're going through the process, if you could. So I, uh, I know a friend who had joint accounts and, um, and, uh, and one spouse separated out and created uh, their own um, personal accounts. And the other spouse sort of didn't realize things were going to happen and kept everything coming into the joint accounts. And so the one spouse left with cash and the other spouse left with debts. How do you, particularly if you're not anticipating something like that, what do you do to protect yourself? Yeah, this this phase between separation and having your final deal done, you know, you're still impacted financially by the behavior of your soon to be ex. And, you know, there, there are, I, I try not to give legal advice, but there are potentially legal remedies, but sometimes the horse has left the barn. Um, and so the, the ideal would be that to the extent that you have joint assets, that you continue to own assets together because it's impossible to immediately divide all those assets, that you both are making decisions about what is happening with those, with those assets, at least if big things are happening. And so, you know, if during the marriage, your partner was making all the investment decisions and, um, and that was working for you, you now have to shift into collaborating on making those, those decisions together. The practical reality is that, that that often doesn't happen. And so you have people who are unilaterally um, entering into transactions or making decisions about joint assets, and then you're left trying to seek legal remedy. What about the kids? What do you do? Is there like an interim kid strategy? Yeah, this is this is a harder place to have boundaries. Um, and I, I mean, I've been there personally, and I've I've witnessed clients going through it. I think it is. Um, it's the part of divorce, divorce that sort of rips your heart out. Um, but you definitely need, and I would say that 
uh, if you have kids and you are contemplating divorce, this is a, a major topic that you want to address with your lawyer before you even start. Um, and hopefully, I mean, the ideal is that you're collaborating with your partner, your co-parent, um, to do what is best for the kids. The, the challenge is that the parents well, and the kids, you're all in the middle of a traumatic experience. And of course, every parent loves their kid, but we're, we're not at our best when we're going through that. And so, you know, to accept that there, there's going to be pain and bumps in the road for you and for your kids. Um, I believe that people can come through it stronger and that, um, in the end, most parents are making decisions for the benefit of the kids. But uh, I, I think it's, especially in the divorcing phase, I think handling um, your kids' pain and grief and trying to sort out what a new normal might look like is the by far the hardest part of divorce. I had a discussion over dinner a couple of weeks ago with someone who was convinced the right strategy, particularly with younger kids, was to leave them in one house and have the parents come and go. And then another person at the same dinner was like, no, then you can never move on because you're always stuck in the, in the former house. Do you have a point of view on that? I've heard of people, you know, allowing the kids to say, stay and moving in and out uh, as the adults. And, and I, I get it. I think it's lovely. I think it, I think in the short term and uh, it may be in that divorcing phase, perhaps it can work just for me personally. I, I, it's hard to conceive of it working in terms of repartnering. I, I, in my second marriage, I'm stepmom to, to my husband's three kids from his first marriage. And um, I think that we had positive uh, co-parenting relationships with his ex. I, I can't really imagine though sharing a home uh, with them. So I, I, I love the sentiment from a practical perspective. It's tough for me to conceive of how it works. I'll say when I was separated, when my husband and I were separated, um, my home was, was more the home base for our kids. They saw their dad a ton. Um, he would come over and he would, he would do things with them. And they definitely stayed at his house occasionally, but I, I witnessed my stepkids having two home bases. And, and I also, as a kid in a blended family moved from house to house and it's challenging. I think you have to do everything you can to mitigate the impact of it. I'm a fan of living as close as possible together. Really living as close as possible, but not actually together. Not actually together. Yeah. We're, we're chatting tonight with Kelly Laval. She is a divorce specialist with an advisory practice that helps people navigate financially complex divorces. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Kelly in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with uh, Kelly Lavalli. She is a CPA, a divorce specialist. She's recently released a book called Untying the Knot to help guide people through the financial implications of divorce. Uh, and we're being, uh, we're, we're talking through the, uh, the, the getting ready for and the considering and the planning for stages. Now let's turn to the actually implementing stage. So, so Kelly, uh, you've decided that you're going to divorce and, uh, and, and you're going to start that process. What are the financial steps you need to actually take to get a financial final deal with your ex-partner? I mean, I encourage people to think about it like a negotiation. And, and again, now we're just talking about the financial part of divorce, which um, I, it, I really would encourage you to think of it like a business deal. Um, obviously, you have lots of feelings about this process, about divorce, but this slice of it is a negotiation of a, a business deal. The more you can kind of put your accountant or pragmatic hat on while you're while you're trying to reach an agreement, the better. And I would say the process, it's, it's really quite simple. It's, it's not easy, but it's simple. You're trying, you, you just come up with a list of what do you own? What are your assets? What do you owe? What are your debts? And then you determine of those assets and debts, what is shared? So what's part of the family pie? Because certain things might be excluded. 
you know, it's, you know, depending on your situation. So what are the things that you're sharing that you have to divide? And then what are you going to do with them? You are going to keep some, your ex is going to take some, maybe you share some, <laughs> although that stresses me out, the idea of you sharing your assets with your ex, but, and maybe you're going to sell some and split the proceeds. Um, and then the next step is just to say, okay, to the extent that you're keeping some of the assets or your ex is going to keep some of the assets, what are they worth? Because you, you have to buy, essentially buy out your ex's interest in all the assets you want to keep. And they have to buy out your share of the assets that they want to keep. Now you won't finalize those choices until you know the price, until you know the value. So you might say, I want to keep the family home, but if you find out that it's valued or appraised at twice what you thought it might be, that might change, that might impact your decision, right? So you need to, to value the assets. And then to the extent that you're taking more of the pie than your ex, you'd have to make some kind of equalization payment. So that's the asset side of the equation. And then after you've done that, you have to resolve the issue of support, child support, spousal support. So those are the steps. They sound relatively simple, but there are lots of complex issues buried in, in that, including a, a big hang up is this process of valuing things that you're not selling to anyone. You're just taking some and your ex is taking some. And you have to determine what they're worth with, without having a transaction to rely on. Um, and that can be challenging. There can be uh, some conflict over that one. Okay, so let me ask you a few questions. I've heard some people that uh, you know, have a family cottage. Uh, so it's not the marital home, but it's a family cottage. And, uh, and if it's sold, you're going to incur big capital gains taxes. Uh, and, uh, and the kids love it. Um, no one wants to buy out the other partner. And then someone suggests sharing it. Would you ever share a second home or a family cottage with an ex-spouse? I, I believe that there are circumstances where it makes good sense to share assets. Um, I think it really depends on the, and if, if we're talking about a recreation property, it depends on the nature of the relationship. I think, especially in the short term, it, it can work. There often isn't new partners to consider. Um, I think that the key is to have an agreement in writing that governs the sharing and has a mechanism to unravel it um, so that if things change and maybe the relationship isn't as amicable as you'd hoped or a new partner is not big on the sharing arrangement, you have a mechanism for selling or buying one of the, one of the other out. What about furniture? What if someone just ups and leaves with a whole bunch of nice expensive furniture without approval? This, these things are difficult because um, used furniture is not valuable um, just from a financial pragmatic perspective, but it has value practically speaking and sometimes sentimental value. Um, and so I would say these types of things um, which I, I might put in the, the, the bad behavior bucket <laughs> can really derail the process. So to the extent that you can be fair around things that they, they don't have a huge financial impact, um, but they can impact the process. They can impact your relationship. And I think an important part of this divorcing life phase is to shift your thoughts about your relationship with your ex, especially if you have kids, which means an ongoing connection. From looking back at the marriage and perhaps having anger about how it ended, because frankly, it's, it's a rare situation where people haven't behaved badly in some way at the end of their marriage. But if you can shift from looking back to looking forward and saying, you know, I, I'd like, to, I'm, this is what I hope for you is that, you would like to behave in a way that sets your relationship up for success moving forward, including um, sets up a, a good situation for negotiating. And I think that a good negotiation, you, you trust your counterparty. 
trust it can be on short supply as you start the process of getting divorced, but um, you can behave in a way where, okay, when you say you're going to do something, you do it. I can rely on the fact that you're not going to be completely unreasonable. And so I would just be cautious about um, doing something that might feel good in the short run, but might damage the, the negotiation process or your relationship with your ex moving forward. Trust. Doing doing what you say. That's, you know, interesting uh, objectives. Hopefully they exist. Um, let's talk about uh, some tax implications. So, uh, you know, my understanding is that a equalization payment in a separation agreement um, that's negotiated is tax-free. Um, but if a court orders the sale of assets, then regular um, tax rules apply like capital gains tax. And so if one moves out of a house um, and it's a couple of years till the house is sold, then you got to pay capital gains on that tax. But if you actually, um, in a negotiated agreement, um, have an equalization from a, a spouse, it's not subject to tax. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, the, the general rule in Canada is uh, upon divorce, assets can move between spouses without tax. So they move at what's called cost base, right? Um, which means that whoever takes the asset down the road, uh, unless it's say a principal residence where they can have a tax-free gain, um, they're going to pay tax. So a big consideration when you have, you're not selling something is, okay, how are we gonna handle the fact that there is potentially a future tax bill that the party taking the assets going to assume? So that factors into the value of the asset. I, I think that the, the other benefit of behaving well in a negotiation is that together you can plan to minimize taxes. So it's, it is a shared obligation. Um, and so to the extent, say, that your spouse is taking on some future tax obligation, they're going to pay you less for the asset. Um, and so you want to be in a situation where you can plan to your point, Brian, about, well, what if the court orders the court is it's no disrespect, but it's a blunt instrument. They're not going to get creative from a tax perspective. Um, and so you're, you're a lot better off to come up with something that minimizes tax together in a negotiation. Okay. But, but let's say I moved out of the marital house um, four years ago. And, uh, and the divorce is, is final today, and, uh, and the court uh, orders the sale of the house as part of uh, the final satisfaction. Um, if I had lived in the house and it was my principal residence, I would have enjoyed all of that capital gain tax-free. But now I'm told that, uh, no, I've got to pay capital gains on the gain in the real estate value from the date that I moved out of the marital home. Yeah, unfortunately, until you're divorced, you share principal residence <laughs> exemption with your, your spouse. So you have one between you. So if they're in the family home and you rent, then you're okay. Like you're, you're, you can still say that family home in which your spouse still, or ex now, still resided, that, that is still eligible for the principal re residence exemption. But once right? you're divorced... The principal resident exemption and you have applies? To, well, so once you're divorced, then now you each have one. You're not considered a family unit by CRA. So you so can't have, they can't have, if you no longer live in the residence, you can't claim it as a principal residence. Yeah, that's right. So a, after your divorce, so up until the time you're divorced and say you're not cohabitating, you still have to share a principal residence exemption. I think that's what you're saying. This is a problem because what if you buy another house? Yeah. Yeah. So, so these sorts of things. So, happen. so this is interesting. So if you actually buy another house, but you're still divorced, you can't claim that as a personal residence. If you are divorced, you but can. if you're not divorced, you're just separated. Yeah. If you're just separated and you buy a new home, you got to pay capital gains on, on, on that portion between when I moved in and bought the new home until such time as I actually finalized the divorce. Yeah. So the way the principal residence exemption is it's a ratio, right? So to the extent that you have years where you can uh, designate that property as the principal residence exemption, 
it's going to create and say you own the property ultimately for 10 years, but you were sharing a principal residence exemption with your ex while you were going through divorce. So you didn't get the principal residence exemption, say for two years, when and if you sell that home 10 years later, you're going to have two tenths of that gain would be taxable. What happens if you don't, uh, if you don't declare? Oh, what, with, with what you get a one year, <laughs> they give you a plus one. And I think it's to deal with these transition issues. Sadly, um, when you're getting divorced, it can take a lot longer than a year, but you, you have one year where CRA says we get that you may be in transition. What happens if uh, you owe a capital gain because it's no longer a principal residence and you don't declare it? What does CRA do? Well, I would never advise that you don't. I mean, they have to find you, of course, but they're getting better at that. They look at land title transactions. Um, don't evade tax. <laughs> it's a bad idea. <laughs> I agree. It's a very bad idea. Uh, but it's interesting <laughs> that, 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 you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, a equalization payment as part of a divorce or separation is tax free, but a whole bunch of other things, particularly if ordered by a court, are no longer tax free. Yeah. And anytime you're selling to a third party and dividing the proceeds, then to the extent that there's any unrealized gain, which you're now crystallizing, you, there will be tax to pay. So you'll be dividing after tax proceeds in that case. What are some of the common pitfalls in, uh, in negotiating a settlement? Um, I think that um, one misconception is that you will get justice through this process, that the divorcing process is somehow going to address the wrongs that you suffered during your marriage and in particular at the end of the marriage. And so when you wrap that around your negotiation, that instead of just looking at what are your rights and responsibilities and being, you know, pragmatically working towards um, a deal, you're looking for compensation for pain. So I would I understand the desire for justice. It's just that the process of divorcing is not set up to give you justice. That's not what it's about. So I think if, if people can set that aside um, and to the extent possible, just remember that it's only money. I mean, I'm an accountant, so I believe that money is very important and we need it to buy things that we need and want. But especially when you're going through divorce, you often wrap a lot of other meaning around money. Um, you know, like, did, did he ever really love me if he's asking for half the value of my jewelry? So I think just to chant to yourself, it's only money um, to the extent that you can and compartmentalize the, the emotional aspects of divorce, you will be better off. Um, and I think that the key there, like I mentioned, is to really think of this process as your future. This is about moving through addressing your rights and responsibilities as they exist under the law and defining your future, looking to the future, as opposed to using this as some tool to deal with path, the past or your marriage. Jewelry. Um, you said that uh, someone can ask for half the value of the jewelry. I thought jewelry was a gift. And so therefore... Um, you can't ask for half the value. So it, again, depends where you live. Um, but here, if, if jewelry is significant, excluded property, so gifts are included as excluded property, but not when they're between you and your partner. So it's gifts from the external gifts, as long as, and still the devil's in the details because you have to have maintained their separation from the family asset base. But so when you're thinking of what's excluded, you need to get legal advice, right? So because it's unique based on where you live, um, but it's a relatively short list and you can jeopardize things that might otherwise be included or excluded, sorry, by bringing them into your family asset base. So if you get an inheritance and you use it to pay down the mortgage on the family property, you may have just compromised that exclusion. 
Um, but this is this is what I was saying that every divorce is unique. Um, you really need this is one of the tricky areas where you need to talk to a lawyer about your particular situation. What about clothing like a mink coat or a whole bunch of clothing? Is that a, a family asset that needs to be valued and split up? So I encourage people to just focus on the material assets because things like stamp collections and clothing, handbags, um, fishing gear, these things are, um, they, they're emotional for people. And often both parties have a list of this type of asset. And um, so if it's remotely close to a wash, I encourage people to just say, Let, well, let's focus on the, the big but stuff. What if it's not remotely close to a wash? What if, what if one spouse takes all the expensive furniture, all the clothing and all of the jewelry and leaves behind the crap? When it comes to, to furniture, because we're looking at, um, you know, for furniture, for example, it will be valued at next to nothing. And so that's, you know, I think, the person that does that, that takes, say, all of the furniture, it's, um, it isn't a good start to the negotiation because it is a benefit, but it's not a benefit that your ex is likely to be compensated for. So, um, you know, I, but I what if you like... just take it without approval? Like you just take it without the other person saying you can take it. Isn't that wrong? I think it's wrong. I think it, I don't think it sets you up for a good divorcing stage, but, but some of this behavior, there isn't a good remedy for. Um, and so I, I don't like using the word fair, because if you ask 10 people what fair is, you'll get 10 different answers. Um, but I would encourage you to, to try to be fair when it comes to these what, what I will call details, they don't feel like details when you come home and your ex has emptied out the house of all the furniture, that doesn't feel like details. But from a legal and financial perspective, it's likely to be a detail. Um, and so you really uh, hope to just treat one another fairly. I think that would be a great objective. Uh, uh, I don't think it happens all the time. Maybe people no. need more of your involvement and advice. We're chatting tonight with Kelly Lavalli. She's a CPA, CA, and a divorce specialist. She's written a book recently uh, called Untying the Knot that's available wherever good books are sold. We're going to take a break um, for some final messages and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Uh, an interesting conversation tonight with Kelly Lavalli. She's a CPA, a divorce specialist. She's recently released a book, uh, released a book called Untying the Knot that guides people through the financial implications of divorce. And she provides a service to people. Um, and you can get it from her website. To, what is it? Lavalli.com? .ca. Lavalli.ca to get her uh, accounting and financial advice uh, in, uh, in, in a divorce. Um, Tell me a little bit about negotiation. Are there strategies or suggestions you've got? Yeah, I think, um, and some of this is going to seem maybe super simple, but when you're when you're going through divorce, you you aren't thinking clearly, and you might not necessarily be thinking about this strictly as a business deal. I get it. Um, I think first, you know, there's of course, we, we hope to not go to trial and, and most situations, you do end up with a negotiated outcome. But in the back of your mind, you need to be thinking about what would the court do? Because this is a legal process, we need to understand what is the worst case scenario if you ended up in trial? And what's the best case? Because any negotiated outcome has got to be within those goalposts. No one would if they're being well advised, offer you more than your best case scenario if you went to trial. And you shouldn't take less than your worst case scenario if you went to trial. And so I think when you're thinking about what's my bottom line, which can be tough, it can be tough to put yourself in that position of trying to figure out what you'd be willing to accept, but at least be considering if everything fell apart, what might the court do? It can be tough to have your lawyer <laughs> tell you definitively because you know court is so uncertain, but to have a sense of 
what the range of possible outcomes would be. You really need that in order to determine your bottom line. You also need to know the numbers. So I would say as you're heading in, don't decide what your bottom line is without that important information. I would say also expect that you will need to make concessions. It's not reasonable or realistic to expect that you will come out of this with everything that you wanted. It's not how it works. And you shouldn't be giving up everything to your ex. So it will be a give and take. And it's uncomfortable. It's not fun to make a concession, but you have to wrap your head around it, get advice about what are the right concessions and when is the right time to make them. But you're going to have to make some. You've said that uh, there's some three things that uh, people need to remember. What are those three final things? Um, first, I would say get help. It's a legal process. It's a technical process. And um, I, I clearly have a conflict of interest, but it's, it's not a do-it-yourself project. And you're not a bad person and you're not creating an adversarial situation by getting the help that you need. You don't know what you don't know. And this is, uh, in most cases, something that is going to dramatically impact the rest of your life. So I would say get help um, to the extent that you can remember that it's only money. Um, yes, it's important, but if you could compartmentalize all of the emotional issues that you're working through when you're getting divorced from the financial aspects, and remember, it's only money, it's only money. Um, you will be more pragmatic and it'll be less painful as you move through the business of your divorce. You'll be able to make de decisions more effectively. Um, and I would say, depending on your situation, it's a massive project. And when you step back and look at the whole thing, it can feel super overwhelming. And so just focus on the next step. You can handle the next step. And I promise you, you can handle the whole thing. Um, but contemplating and like looking at all the uncertainty is super scary. So it's just one step at a time. You can do it. Let me ask you one last question, if I could. After all of this uh, discussion and your experience, um, if people were going to get married, would you recommend prenups? I'm a fan. I'm a fan of the prenup. Like, so when you get married, you, you are entering into a legal arrangement, but in too many cases, you have no idea what that arrangement is. All that a, a prenup or a marriage contract is, is saying, look, the, the family law where we live is this broad brush that's supposed to apply to everyone. And we'd like something that's customized. I get that it's not romantic. You're contemplating the end, but, but there are already laws that address the end of your relationship. You just didn't choose them. Like I'm a fan of choosing them. So you do think prenups make sense? I do. Do you have one? No. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Kelly Lavalley, thank you so much. This has been really quite interesting. Your book is called? Untying the Knot. And your website is? Lavalley.ca. So uh, let me end with uh, my two cents worth. I think Kelly Lavalley has got some great advice. Um, it uh, Divorce is, is a major life-changing event. And uh, thinking about it uh, very seriously as a business tr uh, transaction, trying to get the emotions out of it is uh, great advice. I don't think a lot of people are able to do that. That's probably one of the, the negatives. Um, and so uh, maybe having people like Kelly involved that can help you get the emotions out of it are key. I also think that a lot of people don't think through the tax implications um, of, uh, of their uh, their divorce transactions. And in business, you would never do a transaction without thinking about the, the after-tax implications. And so therefore, if, uh, if it's all about the money uh, or it's only money, um, and, uh, and it is sort of like a business transaction, a financial transaction at minimum, um, think through the tax uh, implications. Um, Kelly Lavalley, thank you so much. Uh, for uh, joining us tonight. That's my show. I remind you I'm on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online, even from Vancouver at www.saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and video casts are available on briancrombie.com. The videos are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and, uh, and LinkedIn. And the uh, podcasts are on Apple, Audible, and Speakeasy. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Good night.